lots of animal sanctuary. Um, so he became very involved. And at that time, there were some people who became very famous philosophers in Oxford thinking about animals, Ros Godlevich and John Harris. Um, and Richard Ryder was um, also involved. He was, uh, he was a clinical psychologist, but he wrote... He, um, he termed... He created the term speciesism. Um, I've forgotten the name of his book. What was Richard Ryder's book called? I know his latest one, I can't remember his other one. His first one. Oh, is it something revolution? Animal revolution? No, I think it's even before that. Anyway, anyway. So he met he he so he met all these influential people in the animal rights movement. He was much younger than them, obviously. They were like postgrads and I guess he was about sixteen or seventeen. Um, and then he applied to do theology and he applied to the University of Lancaster and uh, King's College London and he didn't think he would get into King's because it was considered a good good university and he didn't feel he had the right background or qualifications um, but he was interviewed by Sidney Evans who was the Dean of King's and he was offered a place um, and so that's where he went to train for the priesthood um, but all the time there was the animal stuff going on in the background and that was when he first became involved in the National Council for the RSPCA and was their youngest council member. I guess he was, I think he probably had to be 18 to be that on that council. So he did that throughout his time at university um, and carried on after that. Yes, he's got a question. Well, define RSPCA. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the RSPCA is, stands for the Royal Society for, for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Say that one more time. The RSPCA stands for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It was started by um, Arthur Broom, who was actually a priest in Victorian times, who saw the cruelty to animals on the streets. You remember at that time he would have used horses, for instance, on the streets and they were badly treated. Um, and he set up this uh, animal protection and Vic Queen Victoria became its first patron, which is why it is called Royal Society, because she endowed that name on it. Um, and it's it's been the leading it was the leading animal charity in England, um, and has spawned various other what we call SPCAs around the world, including America, Australia, around the Commonwealth mostly. Um, and it has a national council which decides on policy. And so when Andrew first joined it. Um, it was in favour of, they were in favour of hunting with hounds, fox hunting. Um, but he met a guy, um, another member called John Bryant, uh, who was also opposed to fox hunting, and they formed something called the Reform Group within the, within the council. And eventually, it took, I think it took quite a long time, he would have to tell you the process, but um, eventually the RSPCA took a vote to become opposed to fox fox hunting and that was at a time when you had very prominent members of the royal family fox hunting regularly so it was quite a, a difficult politically quite a difficult move for the RSPCA um, and he continued to be on the council uh, there was a gap he, he went off it at one time and then I think that somebody persuaded him to, to, to go, well, probably John Bryant actually probably said Andrew needs to do this again, um, but eventually he couldn't stand the bureaucracy that went with it um, and didn't feel that it was doing what he wanted and he'd be better off spending his time writing. Um, Can you say something a bit more about that? You know how Dan isn't good at being in institutions in general because. It's a theme of his life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Yes, I think I think throughout Andrew's life, he's always resisted um, committees and any sort of bureaucracy. He hates that um, CEOs of large charities are paid vast amounts of money. Um, and he's never been good on committees in the church or anywhere else. Um, of his generation, he would have probably been one of the one of his generation who would probably have been a bishop, but he was never willing to play the games that lead you to get to being picked as a bishop. Um, and in fact, he would say now that they're mostly managers, and he hates that kind of culture. Um, Is that all right? Yeah. I mean, I think it applies to Oxford and yes. the starting centre of his own. Yeah, yeah well, so I could say that if you like. Um, would that be oh, do you want me to say, yeah. Um, the post at Mansfield was funded by I4 initially for five years. And then they decided, they agreed to extend it for a further three years. So he was at Mansfield for eight years. But during that time, there was a change of principle and possibly Bursa, I can't remember if the Bursa changed, but certainly the principal changed. And they didn't want to renew his um, his fellowship there. And he looked around for other colleges who would ha home him, as it were. But it's, it's become quite difficult in Oxford because all the colleges have uh, like ruling bo their own ruling bodies who would have to decide. Um, but Blackfriars Hall, which is a Dominican institution, um, he got to know the the regent. The regent there is the head of house, um, and persuaded him that you know, maybe that, that he could go there. And so he was called. I think he was called the B. Jarrett Senior Research Fellow. Um, B. Jarrett being one of the former regents who. Uh, who cared for animals, I believe. Um, and that continued for three years. Um, and then during this time, he realised that uh, the money was going to run out. Um, uh, and he had this dream of setting up a centre of, it, you know, the animal, the, the centre we have now. Um, and somewhere where he wouldn't be um, beholden to anybody else's bureaucracy, I suppose. Um, and he, he could do, do it as he wanted. Um, do you want me to say anything about Priscilla? Not necessarily. No, no. I don't think, no. really. Um, you might want to say something about, you know, what it's like to live with a man who you know, charts his own course and doesn't, you know, play the game and, you know, I mean, how's it felt to it's be? It's pretty inflexible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How has it felt to be his wife, given that you were very easygoing on her? <laughs> how would you describe Andrew James? Um, Andrew's always been an unusual person. He has very, very quite Mm. Start again, hang on. Um, These tennis balls look good, don't they? Yeah. I have to adjust this. I know, right? Like, no good for tennis, but. <laughs> I mean, obviously you love him, and that yeah. can be clear too. But you know, uh, he isn't the easiest of men, and I think it's all right it's to say that. It's important for people to say, you know, things that aren't always huh. promotional about what? that. Yeah, I, I, I think otherwise it's going to appear, you know, not very genuine. So you know, we don't need to worry too much, Mark. Yeah, just say what you think, man. Mm -hmm. it is, it isn't easy. Mm. Well, it's probably honest about it. Pretty room, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame the stained glasses are going to make it in there. Yeah. yeah. It's 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.